Chapter Twenty Three, Part Two of A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life by William Law. Chapter Twenty Three, Part Two. Chapter Twenty Three of evening prayer of the nature and necessity of examination how we are to be particular in the confession of all our sins how we are to fill our minds with a just horror and dread of all sin father as all states and employments of life have their particular dangers and temptations and expose people more to some sins than others so every man that wishes his own improvement should make it a necessary part of his evening examination to consider how he has avoided or fallen into such sins as are most common to his state of life for as our business and condition of life has great power over us so nothing but such watchfulness as this can secure us from those temptations to which it daily exposes us the poor man from his condition of life is always in danger of repining and uneasiness the rich man is most exposed to sensuality and indulgence the tradesman to lying and unreasonable gains the scholar to pride and vanity so that in every state of life a man should always in his examination of himself have a strict eye upon those faults to which his state of life most of all exposes him again as it is reasonable to suppose that every good man has entered into or at least proposed to himself some method of holy living and set himself some such rules to observe as are not common to other people and only known to himself so it should be a constant part of his night recollection to examine how and in what degree he has observed them and to reproach himself before god for every neglect of them by rules i here mean such rules as relate to the well-ordering of our time and the business of our common life such rules as prescribe a certain order to all that we are to do our business devotion mortifications readings retirements conversation meals refreshments sleep and the like now as good rules relating to all these things are certain means of great improvement and such as all serious christians must needs propose to themselves so they will hardly ever be observed to any purpose unless they are made the constant subject of our evening examination lastly you are not to content yourself with a hasty general review of the day but you must enter upon it with deliberation begin with the first action of the day and proceed step by step through every particular matter that you have been concerned in and so let no time place or action be overlooked an examination thus managed will in a little time make you as different from yourself as a wise man is different from an idiot it will give you such a newness of mind such a spirit of wisdom and desire of perfection as you were an entire stranger to before thus much concerning the evening examination i proceed now to lay before you such considerations as may fill your mind with a just dread and horror of all sin and help you to confess your own in the most passionate contrition and sorrow of heart consider first how odious all sin is to god what a mighty baseness it is and how abominable it renders sinners in the sight of god that it is sin alone that makes the great difference betwixt an angel and the devil and that every sinner is so far as he sins a friend of the devil's and carrying on his work against god that sin is a greater blemish and defilement of the soul than any filth or disease is a defilement of the body and to be content to live in sin is a much greater baseness than to desire to wallow in the mire or love any bodily impurity Consider how you must abhor a creature that delighted in nothing but filth and nastiness, that hated everything that was decent and clean, 
and let this teach you to apprehend how odious that soul that delights in nothing but the impurity of sin must appear unto God. For all sins, whether of sensuality, pride, or falseness, or any other irregular passion, are nothing else but the filth and impure diseases of the rational soul. And all righteousness is nothing else but the purity, the decency, the beauty and perfection of that spirit which is made in the image of God. Again, learn what horror you ought to have for the guilt of sin, from the greatness of that atonement which has been made for it. God made the world by the breath of his mouth, by a word speaking, but the redemption of the world has been a work of longer labour. How easily God can create beings! We learn from the first chapter of Genesis. But how difficult it is for infinite mercy to forgive sins! We learn from that costly atonement, those bloody sacrifices, those pains and penances, those sicknesses and deaths, which all must be undergone before the guilty sinner is fit to appear in the presence of God. Ponder these great truths, that the Son of God was forced to become man, to be partaker of all our infirmities, to undergo a poor, painful, miserable and contemptible life, to be persecuted, hated, and at last nailed to a cross, that by such sufferings he might render God propitious to that nature in which he suffered, that all the bloody sacrifices and atonements of the Jewish law were to represent the necessity of this great sacrifice, and the great displeasure God bore to sinners. That the world is still under the curse of sin, and certain marks of God's displeasure at it, such as famines, plagues, tempests, sickness, diseases, and death. Consider that all the sons of Adam are to go through a painful, sickly life, denying and mortifying their natural appetites, and crucifying the lusts of the flesh, in order to have a share in the atonement of our Saviour's death. That all their penances and self-denials, all their tears and repentance, are only made available by that great intercession which is still making for them at the right hand of God. Consider these great truths, that this mysterious redemption, all these sacrifices and sufferings, both of God and man, are only to remove the guilt of sin, and then let this teach you with what tears and contrition you ought to purge yourself from it. After this general consideration of the guilt of sin, which has done so much mischief to your nature, and exposed it to so great punishment, and made it so odious to God that nothing less than so great an atonement of the Son of God, and so great repentance of our own, can restore us to the divine favour. Consider next your own particular share in the guilt of sin. And if you would know with what zeal you ought to repent yourself, consider how you would exhort another sinner to repentance, and what repentance and amendment you would expect from him whom you judge to be the greatest sinner in the world. Now this case every man may justly reckon to be his own, and you may fairly look upon yourself to be the greatest sinner that you know in the world. For though you may know abundance of people to be guilty of some gross sins, with which you cannot charge yourself, yet you may justly condemn yourself as the greatest sinner that you know, and that for these following reasons. First, because you know more of the folly of your own heart than you do of other people's, and can charge yourself with various sins that you only know of yourself, and cannot be sure that other sinners are guilty of them. So that as you know more of the folly, the baseness, the pride, the deceitfulness, and negligence of your own heart than you do of any one else's, so you have just reason to consider yourself as the greatest sinner that you know, because you know more of the greatness of your own sins than you do of other people's. Secondly, the greatness of our guilt arises chiefly from the greatness of God's goodness towards us, from the particular graces and blessings, the favours, the lights and instructions that we have received from Him. Now, as these graces and blessings, 
and the multitude of God's favours towards us, are the great aggravations of our sins against God, so they are only known to ourselves. And therefore every sinner knows more of the aggravations of his own guilt than he does of other people's, and consequently may justly look upon himself to be the greatest sinner that he knows. How good God has been to other sinners! What light and instruction he has vouchsafed to them! What blessings and graces they have received from him! How often he has touched their hearts with holy inspirations, you cannot tell. But all this you know of yourself, therefore you know greater aggravations of your own guilt, and are able to charge yourself with greater ingratitude than you can charge upon other people. And this is the reason why the greatest sinners have in all ages condemned themselves as the greatest sinners, because they knew some aggravations of their own sins, which they could not know of other people's. The right way, therefore, to fill your heart with true contrition, and a deep sense of your own sins, is this. You are not to consider or compare the outward form or course of your life with that of other people's, and then think yourself to be less sinful than they, because the outward course of your life is less sinful than theirs. But in order to know your own guilt, you must consider your own particular circumstances, your health, your sickness, your youth or age, your particular calling, the happiness of your education, the degrees of light and instruction that you have received, the good men you have conversed with, the admonitions that you have had, the good books that you have read, the numberless multitude of divine blessings, graces and favours that you have received, the good motions of grace that you have resisted, the resolutions of amendment that you have often broken, and the checks of conscience that you have disregarded. For it is from these circumstances that every one is to state the measure and greatness of his own guilt. And as you know only these circumstances of your own sins, so you must necessarily know how to charge yourself with higher degrees of guilt than you can charge upon other people. God Almighty knows greater sinners, it may be, than you are, because he sees and knows the circumstances of all men's sins. But your own heart, if it is faithful to you, can discover no guilt so great as your own, because it can only see in you those circumstances on which great part of the guilt of sin is founded. You may see sins in other people that you cannot charge upon yourself, but then you know a number of circumstances of your own guilt that you cannot lay to their charge. And perhaps that person that appears at such a distance from your virtue, and so odious in your eyes, would have been much better than you are, had he been altogether in your circumstances, and received all the same favours and graces from God that you have. This is a very humbling reflection and very proper for those people to make, who measure their virtue by comparing the outward course of their lives with that of other people's. For to look at whom you will, however different from you in his way of life, yet you can never know that he has resisted so much divine grace as you have, or that in all your circumstances he would not have been much truer to his duty than you are. Now this is the reason why I desired you to consider how you would exhort that man to confess and bewail his sins, whom you looked upon to be one of the greatest sinners. Because if you will deal justly, you must fix the charge at home, and look no further than yourself. For God has given no one any power of knowing the true greatness of any sins but his own, and therefore the greatest sinner that every one knows is himself. You may easily see how such a one in the outward course of his life breaks the law of God, but then you can never say that had you been in exactly all his circumstances, that you should not have broken them more than he has done. A serious and frequent reflection upon these things will mightily tend to humble us in our own eyes, make us very apprehensive of the greatness of our own guilt, and very tender in censuring and condemning other people. For who would dare to be severe against other people, when for aught he can tell, the severity of God may be more due to him than to them? Who would exclaim against the guilt of others, 
when he considers that he knows more of the greatness of his own guilt than he does of theirs. How often have you resisted God's Holy Spirit? How many motives to goodness have you disregarded? How many particular blessings have you sinned against? How many good resolutions have you broken? How many checks and admonitions of conscience have you stifled? You very well know, but how often this has been the case of other sinners, you know not, and therefore the greatest sinner that you know must be yourself. Whenever, therefore, you are angry at sin or sinners, whenever you read or think of God's indignation and wrath at wicked men, let this teach you to be the most severe in your censure and most humble and contrite in the acknowledgement and confession of your own sins, because you know of no sinner equal to yourself. Lastly, to conclude this chapter, having thus examined and confessed your sins at this hour of the evening, you must afterwards look upon yourself as still obliged to betake yourself to prayer again, just before you go to bed. The subject that is most proper for your prayers at that time is death. Let your prayers, therefore, then be wholly upon it, reckoning upon all the dangers, uncertainties, and terrors of death. Let them contain everything that can affect and waken your mind into just apprehensions of it. Let your petitions be for all right sentiments of the approach and importance of death, and beg of God that your mind may be possessed with such a sense of its nearness that you may have it always in your thoughts, do everything as in sight of it, and make every day a day of preparation for it. Represent to your imagination that your bed is your grave, that all things are ready for your interment, that you are to have no more to do with this world, and that it will be owing to God's great mercy if you ever see the light of the sun again, or have another day to add to your works of piety. And then commit yourself to sleep, as into the hands of God, as one that is to have no more opportunities of doing good, but is to awake among spirits that are separate from the body, and waiting for the judgment of the last great day, such a solemn resignation of yourself into the hands of God every evening, and parting with all the world, as if you were never to see it any more, and all this in the silence and darkness of the night, is a practice that will soon have excellent effects upon your spirit. For this time of the night is exceeding proper for such prayers and meditations, and the likeness which sleep and darkness have to death, will contribute very much to make your thoughts about it the more deep and affecting. So that I hope you will not let a time so proper for such prayers be ever passed over without them. End of chapter 23, part 2 Recording by Carol Box In Surrey, England